diurnal active during the day. Uh, and you can choose to do that because your test might be available more at night or because it's safer to be active uh, during the night when the predators that like to eat you are actually taking their naps. And so circadian rhythms, those activity patterns that fluctuate over a roughly 24 hour time course, a lot of stuff fluctuates. I always forget to take out my pointer. Um, so here on the left, we see a couple things plotted over time, right? So here we have a couple days, each 24 hours is a, a clock time. That's usually what we put on the X axis in these uh, experiments. And then this is just overall activity, walking around, uh, doing stuff, not laying down and sleeping. Uh, they were actually, these are people experiments, so they actually hooked them up to uh, temperature measurements from their bum bum, as my two-year-old says. Uh, and you can see that fluctuates over time. Your core body temperature fluctuates over time. It gets uh, higher uh, in the night and it's somewhat cooler during the day. So this is why as a parent, when your kids have a fever, it's always worse at night. Right when the doctor goes home, that's when your kid starts developing a fever. The baseline is already a little bit higher. <laughs> Um, apparently, we fluctuate in how much potassium, I, I guess, how much we pee it out. But so there's all this stuff that is changing that is um, internal, uh, that, that we can, how do you say this? Physiological changes of your body. And these bottom two graphs, super interesting stuff, those are cognitive changes. Your smartness changes over the course of the day, right? We can see here uh, how many sums we make over a certain amount of time dips really right around midnight when I'm still trying to finish up uh, preparing for lecture. You guys might still be trying to cram more stuff in your brain. It's not the best time to do it because you get fewer things done um, as it hits that late hour of the day. And the same here, uh, an estimation of time, they get much worse at it as it hits that midnight hour when you're supposed to be in bed, right? So systemic fluctuations, um, systemic or neural things. So systemic would be how much you're active, your temperature, and how much your body is excreting, digesting, you name it. Yes? Is that truly midnight or is that based on the number of hours since you woke up? So if you woke up at noon, would you have the same effect if you sleep for morning? I think we'll talk a little bit about this. So the clock time of day here is the actual clock time, not based on when you started your day, but the clock time of day. So that correlates with when light and dark would be perceived, right? Um, if you are a night owl, or what's the other word that nobody wants to do? Whatever you are. Early bird. Early bird? Some bird. Yeah, um, and I think it has to do with your intrinsic rhythm. Not everybody has this exactly 24 hour rhythm. You need the light cues to get there. And so some people might actually, would like to have a longer day. So when the day is over, their internal day isn't over yet. So they might be night hours, right? So then in winter, would your pattern be shorter? Would you have less daylight? No, I do feel more sleepy. But the, the, the rotation of the Earth doesn't change, right? You still have day and night occurring with the same overall frequency, even though the timing of the day is shorter. Um, I think it would make sense if in the winter you work shorter days, and in the summer you work longer days. I'm much more awake. I went camping in Sweden. It was three hours dark. We were like, oh, no. Um, so yeah, light, light overrides, and that we'll talk about that. Um, yeah, so jet lag when you are out of sync with the time that's around you, you feel pretty horrible, right? So if you wake up in the middle of the day to start your day, you're out of sync with what's really happening. I wish I could sleep in. Seven thirty, my kids go, "Mom, it's wake up time," and my husband goes, "Yes, it's your wake up." Okay, so activity changes over the course of the day. It's very predictable. Um, 
And so this is done by having this um, circadian timing system. It consists of two parts. The first part is what's inside us, which is that um, endogenous generator in the piece of our brain that is making a more or less 24 hour uh, change happen in all these down, uh, downstream systems. It's not perfect. None of us probably is exactly perfect 24 hours. And also, <coughs> if you on average work 24 hours, you have some fluctuations. So each day, your clock is reset by photo entrainment. So light is a cue that comes in and that helps reset the pacemaker to realize another day has happened. So we have this main pacemaker guy, the master, and then we have those slave clocks. Your individual organs have their own clock. They have uh, some way to generate their own timing but they all listen to the master, and the master listens to light. So it's kind of this uh, sequential way of determining what the actual time is on the clock in each of your tissues. So how do we study this? We use these actograms, and in these actograms, we just put the, the clock time, the time that you can see on your watch, on the x-axis, and then we plot with these black little bars if an animal is active. So if you have a mouse in a cage, you can put a treadmill in there. And if the mouse is on the treadmill running that they like to do in the daytime, that's recorded as activity. And you can plot that with those black bars. So this mouse was not active here, probably sleeping. And then it woke up, started treadmilling, took a break maybe to take some food in, did a little more treadmilling, and then his day was over. Now you see that this mouse is not receiving any light cues, right? So we like to do these experiments with or without light cues. It's easy for us if it would be always light, but it's nicer for the mice if it's kind of dim. So if it says no light cues, usually we put these animals in a somewhat dim environment so we can still see what they're up to and they can have enough darkness to take their rest. <coughs> um, let's see. The time here is 24 hours. Sometimes it's like plotted over 48. It doesn't really matter. And then you can see that this mouse is active for, is inactive for a while, and then active. And then this is the next day. And you see that it starts a little sooner here, right? It's active and then inactive. And then the next day, again, a little sooner. So there you can already tell that in the absence of light cues, that this mouse had a shorter than 24 hour day. Its day was already over before the clock time was up. So the actogram moves over to the left, right? We can see that right from this um, scale. And so even though there's no light cues, there's still a circadian rhythm, a more or less 24 hour repeating pattern of activity. If we put the same mouse on a light and dark cycle, now all of a sudden the light is entraining our internal clock. And we can see that in the light times, the mouse is very much inactive. And when it's dark, the mouse is very active. Mice are night creatures, so this is what they do. <coughs> and so now we don't see this over the course of several days. We don't see that the activity pattern moves up. So it's relying on the internal clock, but the cues of light are entraining it to really align with what's actually happening on the outside, the external clock. And so anything that can do this, we call it sight gaber. Most often the sight gaber is light, the time giver, that will tell our internal clock, this is the new day, get ready for the new day. Um, most experiments will use light, but we'll see at the end of lecture that um, how you distribute your eating over the day can also make a difference for the timing of your internal clock. Yes? Why again do we see the pattern of the shift of the previous slide? So the previous slide, the time scale at the bottom here is the same, right? A regular 24-hour clock you see on your watch, irrespective of what happens in the animal. So this animal's day 
that it internally thinks of when it doesn't have any cues is shorter than 24 hours. So it's, it's sleeping, it's awake, and then it's sleeping again, but it actually wakes up a little sooner than exactly 24 hours later, right? So the first activity that you see, that's just the way that this guy's internal clock is set up. For us, I think it varies between like 23 and 26 hours or so. So if you were to put us all in a cave, we'd all start to be totally out of sync with each other. And it really depends on the, um, I guess the, what's the word for it? The genetic variation in those genes, some of them might have a little bit more of this, a little less of that, so we'll see what fits the clock together. Uh, and the variations in that will determine what your personal internal clock is. Yes? So like, the days are shorter, but like the amount of the activity must that will not wear a factor, does that change? Good question. Is it the sleep or the active time that gets cut? I imagine both, but you, what I was looking at here is the appearance of activity, and I see that that moves over to the left. So if that was because it slept. I don't know if we can say that, but I think it's the same day, like 24 hours. So the, it's in is not telling it that a day lasts exactly 24 hours. And I'm not telling it what time it is by not turning on the light. If I turn the light on at 6 o'clock every morning, like we do for the mice that we have for our experiments, then every day, again, their internal clock would be reset for an hour. Right? And then we'll start taking a nap. But these mice, they don't have any other clues than whatever their own body is telling them. So the way that that system tells you now it's time for activity, now it's time for inactivity, it just runs through the day a little faster. Does that make sense? It just looks better, like you said, when I change the activity, because it's affecting the body. Kind of like, not so much. So you mean between this activity bout or this activity yeah. bout? No, so we could start the graph here, right? It doesn't matter. It would always be active a little earlier than it was the, the start of its activity the previous day. Oh, see that word there, free run. So if you have no information of life, if there are no sight gavers, we call it that you are in free run. This is the term that you guys should uh, know what it means. So when you're in free run, we can calculate what your internal clock thinks is the appropriate length of the day. Ah, and that's exactly what we'll be doing. How about that? So here's the activity of a hamster. It was either given no light cues, so it was always in sort of semi-darkness. That's the first 27 days of this plot. And then on day 28, we started turning on and off the light to and train it to a proper 24 hour day. So two questions that we can uh, talk about with each other. What is the approximate intrinsic rhythm of this hamster? How long does this hamster think a day lasts? And then the other question that we should be able to gather is, is this a diurnal or a nocturnal animal? based on when its activity occurs. So okay. take a couple minutes and we'll come back. What's the one axis? Days? Number of days? Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. It is days. Yeah. So 1 through 27, they decided to keep darkness. And then it looks like it's shifting. And then once you get to like 27, then you give it a, a, a day and night time. So then, after that, everything kind of just, um, it looks like it, everything's, you may, yeah, okay, so. See, that's how it is going to be for So then they do need the light. Yeah, but that's because they're giving it light. The first 27 days, they won't. 
but see, the first 27 days they were, but they were still pretty close. They were. They were shipping. What do you think, Kay? What? Oh, I thought we got to talk during the second part. Yeah. yeah. No, no, the first one. Um, like the, the clock, the internal clock. I feel like it's like 26 days. 26 hours. <laughs> 26 hours. That's my guess. 24, if it was 24, it would be a straight line. But it's shifting. Is this a diurnal or a nocturnal animal? And why did you think it was? Yes. Nocturnal because? And so the time of activity, you see that because of these yes. thicker lines of activity. And they occur more in when there is light and day in the dark area. So this is a nocturnal animal. So what, how did you guys go about getting at the length of the day for these guys? Who wants to offer their insights? Did anyone get an answer for this, or are we also working? Yes. Can you explain how you know what's light, what's dark, and what's actually their action? Because it just kind of looks like a piece of bread. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is when there's no light cues. And so I've told you that usually we use some sort of a pretty dark, but not absolutely pitch black. Okay. So. And that's what happens in the first 27 days, right? So we have 27 days of no light cues at all. It's always the same intensity of light, and it's a low intensity. And then for 20 days, 28 to 48, so the bottom half of the graph here, over the course of the day going from 0 to 24 hours, we have a period of light a period of dark, indicated by the dark bar, and then some more light, right? And this one will then whoop, go over into the next days. So those top two bars are the time scale. Is that what you're Essentially, yep. Yeah. And so, the pro what is it? Is it 12, 12, or maybe 10, 14? I can't really, if I add this and this up, is that the same amount of time as this? But they chop the day into a light time and a dark time. And so if this is the dark time, can you see the difference in activity between what they do in the light and what they do in the dark? Okay, I couldn't quite hear your description of what you thought it looked like. It's like a salty. A salty? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's spooky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you kind of, if you want to stay away from it, you got to stay yeah. in the okay. light. Like, if you want to stay in So you see how here the yeah. pattern of activity all starts pretty much right at the edge of when the darkness sets in. Whereas here That's it's moving it's over. Exactly. Right? So we start off at the day one, the activity is over here. The next day the activity occurs a little sooner, and then the next day the activity starts to occur a little sooner again. So that already tells you that this internal clock is what? Faster or slower than the actual clock? Faster, right? Faster. Because its day is a little shorter, it already thinks that it's wake up time a little earlier. My kids here. Wake up time, wake up time. And so how can we then calculate what the internal clock's day length is? We can look at the shift over several days, right? So if this is a 24 hour clock and we start day one here, and by, what is it? So let's say, how many days does it take to get a 12 hour shift from here to here? Is that about it? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 17 days to get a 12 hour shift from the start of my day. 
So that means that 1217 of an hour is cut out of eighth of my day. Does that make sense? I will ask you to do this calculation, but it'll be like, you don't have to use your calculator. If you write out the numbers without giving me the answer, I'd be happy to. <laughs> no, this is fine. Hours. Oh, yeah, I'll put some hours. This is a really, really blank <laughs> thing. I'll put some hours. Um, tomorrow in discussion, we'll do this exercise again, and then there's numbers. But the thing to do is to look at, I have a certain start time here. Say I'm calling this, what, 8 o'clock at night, or whatever, 8 o'clock in the day. And then over the course of several days, I keep losing time. And so it's more accurate to go over several days because there is some variation, as you can see. So you can either say I'm counting out 10 days, and then I see how much time I lost. And so I know I lost six hours over 10 days, which means each day I lost 26 hours. Right? Yes. Is there an actigram where it starts off on the left side and it, it kind of treadmills down to the bottom? To the right? right? Yeah. How, what, what would make that happen? I'm not sure that's why I'm wondering. <laughs> Because, yeah, that can happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to help this guy out? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wait, what? Is this in response to Brian's question? Wait, it's going to the right. Right? So this is. Oh, if it was going. So Brian is saying, do we ever get to see the activity pattern instead of shifting over to the left, do we ever see it shifting over to the right? No, no. If I start the actogram looking, I start looking at day 10, it would still shift over to the left, right? If I go down in days. No? Yes? Yes, yeah, exactly. Because then the 24 hour clock would be over, but this animal is still thinking it's not yet time for activity. Wouldn't this be great if I could just do this? Wonderful. So they would think that no, it's not wake up time for mommy. Actually, I have another hour. So then only an hour later they start their activity. And the next day, an hour later, they start their activity. So then it would shift over to the right. Excellent. Yes. What about post hibernation? Hibernation. Wow, that's a really big shift in activity. Um, so that's, I think, also given in by cues of light and temperature, but they really shut everything down and only occasionally come back to, you know, I guess some use of boiling the minute they like that to sleep. Yes? Um, so in days defined as um, the time between zero and when um, the animal wakes up, but what about like the fact so that if, it's, if the lines are shifting back? to the left, are we not gaining um, the time at the after, like after it wakes back up again? Um, so I guess I'm just kind of confused as to the definition of the day. We're not gaining time at the end because that would then mean that it it gets a, exactly 24 hour day, but just each day changes how long it's active, I guess. All right, so this animal might think that a day takes 23 hours. So on day one, it starts at time zero to be active. Then after 23 hours, its day is over. And it restarts its cycle of activity. So we would see activity at the very beginning and in the last hour of the actual clock day. Then if it's active for 10 hours each day, it's already done the first hour right here. So on the second day, the beginning of the day activity would only be nine hours. And then we would have a bunch of hours of nothing. And then the last two hours would start to show you. It really just shifts in and out of the picture. Okay. All right, we'll do another one of this tomorrow. Let's move on so that we also get into the other stuff that we want to talk about. So the structure in our brain that actually is this clock generator is the SCN suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's called supra because it's sitting on top. Chiasmatic, it sits right on top the crossover of your optic nerves. 
right? And input from your right eye goes to the left side, and from your left eye goes to the right side. Where they cross over, right on top of that, sits some brain cells, and then those make up the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And that is our endogenous generator, the one that tells our body in the absence of any light or other cues that this is about how long your day should last. Uh, it's part of the hypothalamus, this structure that we know very well from our endocrine lectures that integrates a lot of signals already, stuff on um, stress, the body temperature, we do name it, a lot of stuff goes through there. And so now also our internal clock is part of that very important <coughs> structure. Um, you can uh, identify them as a nucleus similar to those uh, areas of more dense neurons that we talked about for bird singing. This is another one, just a cluster of neurons that have together a, a function, and in this case, the function of being a clock. So this picture on the left keeps puzzling me, but I think what they're trying to say is we have that chiasm running through here, and then on top sits the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus, we can take tissue slices out of it and look at um, activity in these tissue slices. And so what do they have? Normalized mm -hmm. unit activity. So we can see that over the course of several nights and days and nights and days, there's this very regular activity pattern coming off of these cells, right? So even in culture, without being attached to anything else, as long as we manage to keep these cells alive, they will show a circadian pattern. How do they do that? So here we go back to a little bit of um, cell signaling. And so we have a couple of genes working together that either um, that start making each other or inhibiting each other, and that's how the cycle starts. So we have a couple <coughs> transcription factors here called clock and BML1, and they are going to drive transcription of these clock genes, per and cry, period, and I think it's cryptochrome. And so those, the transcription of those results in uh, a protein being made for both of them. They dimerize and then they come back and they inhibit clock and BMEL, right? So these, it's sort of negative feedback going on right there. Clock and BMEL induce transcription of fur and cry, and the proteins of fur and cry come back in and inhibit clock and BMEL from making their own transcripts. So if there's a lot of this protein, it's going to inhibit the generation of new message for that same protein. And this cycles on and off with a time period of about 24 hours. Uh, and so one thing that we should consider then is that these proteins are not permanently stable, right? They get degraded because otherwise once you have these proteins, it doesn't matter. We can always inhibit clock and beam. <coughs> so clock and beam I'll drive transcription of fur and cry. Fur and cry proteins work together to inhibit clock and BMEL, but over time, fur and cry are degraded. So there's a bunch of ways that we can tweak the system. We can tweak how well they interact, we can tweak how fast they are degraded, and all those things together determine then how long this system takes over one whole cycle of making message and protein to stop to make message. And so these two are not the only genes that are being transcribed. We also get these clock effector genes that are going to be telling our bodies to prepare for the meal, to wake up, or to start secreting this or that that we need for that time of day. So let's see, did we run through everything? I think we did. And so this kind of a system is a delayed feedback transcription translation loop. Apparently they occur more often, but it's really typical of the circadian clock. Right, so you guys should be familiar with clock and female, what they do as a pair, and then how period and cry are helping to reset on a daily basis this activity. Question? Yes.
what starts them? I think those we can assume to be pretty much present all the time and doing their job unless inhibited by crying for it. Right, so here we go. Yesterday I had a question about sham, so we can address it now in class. The superchiasmatic nucleus is necessary for circadian timing. So if I were to take the SCN out, you would not see a regular pattern of daily activity. And that's what we see. So here, a mouse was put under uh, with a sedative, and the skull was opened up, they did everything except suck out the SCN, which is what they did on the right hand side. So here, these mice have no SCN, and you can see that they have activity and inactivity over the course of the day, and maybe if you add all the small bouts of activity up, you would get sort of to one big bout of activity that the unlesioned mice would have, but there's no pattern to it, right? The circadian rhythm is gone. So that shows you that the SCN is absolutely necessary for circadian timing. The eyes are not. So remember we said we have an internal clock and it's put to the actual 24 hour clock by means of the input of light. So here we have a mouse in light and dark and light and dark, so over the course of two days. And then at the point of the star, they scoop out the eyes. That's what the manipulation means. Yeah, that's what scientists do. We're not always nice people. <laughs> so we scoop out the eyes, and we still see a regular pattern of activity and inactivity. But what we've effectively done is taken away the entrainment opportunity, right? There's no light coming in that signals to the SEN, this is the actual day. So as soon as the light input is gone, these mice go into free light. They have no input of light. And then these mice, again, have a shorter internal day than the actual day, so their activity patterns start to shift over to the left. Yes? So this is saying that even with having an eyes removed, they still have the same thing? There's still a circadian rhythm. So then why is non-circadian disorder a thing as long as it's a That you can't, so we'll get to that. Blind people still have eyes, right? Yeah. They might not see. And some of them might miss all the structures that are necessary to relay the light information, and some of them may actually some structures that exist still somewhere in our We'll get to it. And so, when they realized that if you scoop out the eyes that you are now in free run, that suggested that, hey, the eyes must be important for this, but they, um, they already knew that if some pigments uh, were missing from the eye that the those people or the mice would still photo and train. So if it if it isn't the eyes, because these pigments in the eyes could be missing it, the stuff would still happen, they figured there might be a photosensor somewhere else. And in birds there is a photosensor somewhere else. Their skulls are fairly thin, so light can reach through, and there's actually brain neurons that have the light sensor, so it's not through the eyes. Um, this is pretty funny. They thought it was a blood-borne receptor, so they took probably some students, right, at a university. They put them in a dark room for many days to get rid of whatever photo entrainment there was, and then they would bind these lights to their knees and cover them up and shine light on their knees where the skin is thin so that the blood receptor could see the light. Uh, and so it turned out that that was not the case. We could not photo entrain them using um, so they went back to thinking it must be um, the eyes, because taking out the eyes would take, get rid of the entrainment. And so if we, if we look at the structure of the eye that is involved in the detection of light, here's our eye, here's the back of the eye, 
light with the retina. The light comes in from the left, goes through the lens and gets focused here on the retina. But it goes through, if you enlarge this area of the retina, it goes through a bunch of different cells before it actually hits the photosensitive um, cell, the photoreceptors. We have rods and cones. Cones, I think, are mostly for the colors, and rods are more for detail, so they're more light sensitive. These guys take in light, they turn it into an electrical signal, and that then goes through these bipolar cells and the ganglion cells and gets sent up to your brain to be interpreted as something that we see. And so it, um, <coughs> people then thought, well, if this is the case, now we can probably say that if we manipulate this here, we won't be able to have um, photo entrainment. So they did that. They made a mutant that lacked both the rods and the cones, so they genetically manipulated the mice, the genes, and, and got rid of all these structures. And if you look at the eyes, indeed, the UV sensitive, green sensitive, and the rods, this is a mouse eye, are present in the wild type, stained with this brown color and these structures are absent in the mutant mice. But they could still be entrained, right? They were no different in the wild type. If you shine light on them with um, increasing intensity, you can still shift the day towards the normal clock using light. So we're not gonna go into details of this, but the main message here is they respond pretty good, just like the wild type mice, to having light there versus not having light there. So the rods and cones apparently are not necessary for photo entrainment. Right, that's the take home message of this slide. And then it was figured out that a small subgroup of those ganglion cells, let's go back there and point them out here, these guys, about one in a hundred actually projects onto the SCN. And not only do they project onto the SCN, they themselves express a photosensitive pigment. So they themselves are able to detect light. They figured this out by injecting a dye into the SCN and then seeing where this dye distributed to. And it turns out that about one in a hundred of these cells that normally send on information to the brain actually also send on some information to the SEM. So they send information to the SEM, they use a different pigment, melanoxin, to detect light and to send the signal onto the SEM of saying there is light. But they're slow, right? You can see that here. We turn the light on on these cells and it takes a couple of minutes in order to see, in order for those neurons to start generating action potential. So this would not be good for our eyes, right? Our eyes respond much faster. How fast do our eyes respond, do you know? Is anybody in a movie making? Right? We use 24 frames per second in movie making, and that's, that's around sort of close to how fast our eyes are able to see new things, changes in light. So um, and this would be one frame in what, two minutes. Right, so way slower. So they respond slowly. You can't really make um, that work for seeing things, but you can use it to detect uh, whether or not it's dark and to help and train the SCN. So then they said, okay, this is it. We'll knock out the melanoxin, right? We got this solved, but they didn't. Melanoxin knockout mice are still responsive to light and dark. This is an actogram of these mice. They don't have melanoxin, so those special ganglion cells targeting the SCN do not see, and yet the activity matches the light and dark cycle. Uh, and here they actually gave a pulsing light and saw the activity disappear, so it was really perfect. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? We've knocked out the rods and cones. We 
we're still in floating entrainment. We're knocked out of the middle of anoxia, and we're still in floating entrainment. We take out the I, we don't have floating entrainment. Mm -hmm. Right? Could these be compensating somehow for each other? Is it either or? How can we test that? You're not, yes. If you knock out the rod, there's no damage. No anoxia. Right. Exactly. So, if we knock out the rods, the cones, and the melanopsin, now they're in free life. So now there's no opportunity for signals of light to get to the SCN, uh, and then there's no photo entrainment. All right, so here again we see a stain for the different things that are present, melanopsin, and the one in a hundred of those ganglions, and this is probably and the dark stain showing some of these layers, but you can see that some of the layers are just missing all together. Um, so that means those cell types are missing all together. <laughs> so it's either or. Either or should work. Um, so what would happen if we take out all the ganglion cells would leave the eyes intact? You see a shape of the head, what does that mean? No entrainment or yes entrainment? No entrainment, right? It's the ganglion cells that everything hinges on. They're the ones responsible for the SCN. Okay. All right. So how does light talk to the SCN? Here we have uh, light coming in to cells of the eye. We get uh, talk in the brain. Signals are going to the SCN. Here's our SCN cell, suprachiasmatic nucleus cell. And there's these neurotransmitters that are acting through some receptor that makes cyclic AMP. So this would be a APCR in B. Um, and then activating protein kinase A. Protein kinase A phosphorylates CREB, thereby activating it. And it is going to help drive the expression of clock genes. Uh, another receptor, an MDA receptor, this is a positive ion channel, results in the influx of calcium, which is also going to, uh, through activation of um, promodulin kinase, I guess, help start the transcription of these clock genes. And here we see that in more detail. So we have the GPCRs coming in, the G alpha, I and S that activate or inhibit adenylate cyclase, G alpha Q going through calcium, cyclic AMP and calcium in this vaguely indicated arrow are helping each other do this. But through the actions of protein kinase A and those CAMKs activate CREB. And CREB has this recognition site in the DNA in those and cry genes that also help drive their transcription. So now in light, we get the activation of these pathways and therefore transcription of fur and cry. So we can imagine if they were at the time that it was still dark, in the, the time that there was not a lot of fur and cry, light has now kick-started it without the help of clock and beam now. Right, so the, it's overriding whatever these guys were doing and starting the day by transcribing her and cry. And that's how every day the light is the reset button for the clock. Like I said, the SCN is the master. The tissues of your body also have internal clocks, but they are reset, there's a slave, they're reset by the SCN. So the SCN is reset by light, and it resets those tissue-specific clocks, and then driving your periods of activity and inactivity. And here is an interesting thing, right, especially in our society. Both of these, the master and the slaves, are sensitive to other things, like when you choose to eat. So if you choose to eat at late at night when your body normally doesn't take in nutrients but should be sleeping, that actually is um, helping reset some of those clocks, has especially effects here. And it results in faster weight gain off of the same calories. They've done experiments where they give mice access to calories, same calories, 
either in their normal active time or in their normal inactive time. Same calories taken in, the mice that are eating outside of their normal time for doing this are fatter. So this is bad for us. All right, and so then, easy with this. Question that you should realize, we can change our clock by our behavior, such as eating outside of normal hours. And this is funny, but every night I stand in front of the cabinet and I'm like, oh, I forgot to buy chocolate. I want some chocolate. So eating that chocolate. That's why I was like, isn't it yet? <laughs> if I just ate it with my tea during the day. But not right before you. Okay. 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 Okay.